my colleague who is, uh, is coming to the podium is uh, Professor William McCoy. He told me beforehand this will be the best lecture on leprosy you will hear today. <laughs> and I think, I think I agree. It I will be. I feel like I can live up to that. I won't do any more introductions and, and, and waste your time, but I just want to make a passing observation. This will, as this day unfolds, you're beginning to see the variety of things that our people at ENC, students and faculty, are interested in. A, 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 an amazing, dizzying array of topics that have caught the fancy and interest of our students. And uh, although it may be disorienting to bounce from one thing to another, uh, glory and revel in the diversity and in the variety of intellectual exercises, endeavors that are going on. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is obviously one very tiny part of my uh, larger dissertation project. So I've tried my best to turn it into a coherent, standalone piece, but if at any moment you feel like you've dropped in on roughly page 90 of a work, um, that's because you have. Um, but uh, nevertheless, hopefully this uh, story about the Swaziland Leprosy Survey between 1946 and 1949 uh, will we'll stand alone in some ways uh, and be coherent. In 1938, uh, Sir Walter Johnson, the superintendent of the Batsabello leper settlement in Basutu land, uh, that would today be Lesotho, uh, visited the uh, High Commission territory of Swaziland to advise the British administration there with regard to its leprosy situation. After a four-day tour of the territory, Johnson composed a lengthy report in which he urged, amongst other things, the gathering of more concrete data about the extent of Swaziland's leprosy situation. To do so, Johnson acknowledged that the most thorough way of gathering the necessary information would be to conduct a full leprosy survey, which would mean hiring a trained medical officer and a team of Swazi assistants to visually inspect as many as possible of Swaziland's estimated 130,000 inhabitants. However, he discounted the idea of the survey for several reasons. Uh, the considerable expense involved, the inevitable slow progress of the survey given the dispersed nature of Swazi homesteads, and the unnecessary alarm that he believed would be caused by carrying out such a relatively invasive inspection. Instead, he suggested that the Swaziland administration emulate a model currently in use in Basutuland, that is to hire and train one or two Swazis to serve as leprosy inspectors charged with the responsibility of identifying additional leprosy cases by examining family members of known patients and other cases reported. It was not until 1946, thanks to World War II, that the Swaziland administration got around to doing anything about these recommendations. And when they did, the wisdom of Johnson's suggestions was rather heartily affirmed, though only in the breach. In 1944, Swaziland had received a large cash infusion by way of a grant from the Colonial and Development Welfare Fund. Though chiefly for construction of a leprosy hospital, the grant also prompted the hiring of Albert John Sowden, a leprosy field worker for the British Empire Leprosy Relief Association, or BELRA. Sowden brought seven years of prior experience in leprosy work, having worked for BELRA in Nigeria and Sudan prior to arriving in Swaziland in November of 1944. The transition was not entirely smooth. There were personal matters combined with construction delay problems and a seemingly endless round of negotiations related to Sowden's financial compensation as he transitioned from Belra to the Swaziland administration. It was out of these protracted negotiations that the decision to have Sowden carry out a full leprosy survey emerged, contrary to Johnson's earlier cautions. Sowden's superiors at Belra felt that it would not be, in their words, the most profitable use of an experienced and efficient worker if Mr. Sowden's activities were confined to looking after a home for a small number of lepers, while nothing was done regarding these, possibly many more, who were outside of it. Belra pressed to this point by soliciting the opinion of Dr. Ernest Muir, Belra's medical secretary at the time, uh, perhaps the most influential voice in the world on matters of leprosy care. Muir, while admitting that he had no direct knowledge of Swaziland, 
offered his view that a man as experienced as Sowden ought to be put to the greatest possible use, which meant a, a fully uh, developed and very active survey work. He ended dismissively with the highlighted text, of course, if the Swaziland authorities wish only to provide a refuge for advanced cases and have no desire to control the disease, that's a different matter. Carolyn Elkins has argued that the singular credo guiding the British Empire was always to trust the man on the spot. But this case illustrates the limits of that trust and the ways in which local officials could be influenced by expertise devoid of context. Muir knew that his statement on the matter, combined with the desire of colonial officers everywhere to ensure that their efforts compared favorably with those in other places, meant that there was very little chance that Swaziland would explicitly commit itself only to constructing a hospital refuge for severe cases, as indeed proved to be the case. The survey project thus began in earnest midway through the year 1946, but it would not be long before Sowden began to encounter difficulties. Backed by Swaziland's Director of Medical Services, uh, Dr. J.C. Callanan, uh, Mr. Sowden, that's him in the corner there, appeared before a meeting of the Swazi Paramount Chief, uh, named Sabuza II, and his counselors uh, at Lobamba in August of 1946. There, Sowden laid out his case for conducting this survey and the critical need for assistance from the chiefs in getting people to turn up for examination. Sowden couched the survey as part of a wider system of control, which would, if properly carried out, mean that at the end of 50 years there will be no leprosy in Swaziland. Sowden thought the survey essential for this purpose, but he recognized also that it was invasive, as examinations required that he do more than examine hands and faces. As he explained to the counselors, and these are his words, it's no good just looking at hands, because leprosy is not often first developed in hands. I want to see the whole body. In effect, Sowden's request to the council was that he be given their permission and support to visually inspect the nearly nude bodies of almost the entire Swazi population in order to identify cases of an illness that Sowden himself had declared affected no more than 200 people in the country. The strategy represented, in nearly equal parts, the hubris of the colonial mindset rooted in scientific optimism and the grim determination of the British to exercise control over leprosy's contagion. No amount of effort was out of proportion with the perceived necessity of eradicating the disease as a medical threat to human well-being. The counselors of Sabuza had words of both support and caution for Sowden, but when one of them suggested that they would need time for discussion, Sowden informed them that he had already decided on a strategy, as he planned to travel with district commissioners on their tax tours to various parts of the country, starting the very next week. Most of the counselors immediately saw a problem with this strategy, uh, as the elderly, women, and children did not commonly turn up at tax camps, and they doubted whether any special appeal for their attendance would be adequate. Sensing that Sowden was not anxious to change his plans, one of the counselors simply observed that the plans he had already made should proceed, as they would undoubtedly enable Mr. Sowden to get useful experience in the difficulties that he will have to face. We don't know whether Sowden followed through with the plans that he outlined, but we do know that he soon began working on arrangements for the leprosy survey to be conducted at the Royal Crawl, that is the Royal Homestead, in Lobamba which he hoped would elevate the public profile of the survey and increase the level of cooperation that he received. What ensued was something of a comedy of errors. The government presented Salem's request to the council on September the 6th. They passed that request on to the Queen Mother, who responded quite swiftly on September the 9th. The trouble was that her response indicated that Salem should come to Lobamba the very next day, a logistical impossibility. At the next council meeting, the administration repeated the request, stressing the need for advance notice this time. In the following week, Sowden did make a visit to Lobamba for the purposes of the survey. The results were exceedingly disappointing. Uh, Sowden had examined only 33 people, and many people were away from the crawl. There had been no discipline, and youngsters had been peeping into the office while he was engaged in examining people. He would be prepared to arrange to come another day if he could be assured that the people would turn out properly and some order could be maintained. When this report was delivered to the council, 
Sabuza reacted strongly and ordered that another date be arranged. But in Febu by February of 1947, Saudin had made two additional visits to Lobamba, and the turnout continued to be unimpressive. These inauspicious beginnings proved a relatively accurate indicator of the progress of the leprosy survey over the following three years. The problems forecast by Sabuza's counselors had proven to be just as troublesome as they had predicted. Saudin attempted to use the tax camps for the survey, but sure enough, it was nearly impossible to get entire households to turn up for inspection there, as the payment of taxes required only the presence of chiefs and headmen. And concerns about the privacy of the inspections continued to crop up very, very persistently in September of 1948, when Sabuza's counselors again heard complaints about the lack of cooperation that had been given to Saudin in the Stegi district Counselors noted that the lack of cooperation on the part of the chiefs might in part be due to the fact that Mr. Soudan had not made arrangements in past surveys for the examination of women folk in private. The assertion that he had paid inadequate attention to privacy provoked a rather forceful reply from Soudan defending the steps that he had taken to address these issues. Acknowledging that there had been some early problems, Saudin protested that he had amended his strategy in later surveys by employing a policeman at the survey site, whose job was to monitor the orderliness of those waiting and to help keep members of the opposite sex apart from one another. Furthermore, whenever possible, he made sure that women were examined in the presence of the chief's head wife or her appointed substitute, and more recently, he had been accompanied by a female nurse. Meanwhile, examinations of men took place in the presence of the chief and often the assistant district commissioner, and all examinations took place indoors or in a tent that Saudin carried with him. He had endeavored to observe any tribal custom of which he was aware and had attempted to accommodate those who requested private examinations or who were denied access to the chief's crawl for any reason. Women wore skirts, men loincloth during their exams. The accumulated list of defensive declaration in Saudin's letter clearly demonstrates his exhaustion with the questions about his concerns for people's privacy, as well as his frustration with the work in Swaziland. Nor did his protest have the desired result. At the following meeting of Sabuza's council, Saudin's letter on the screen behind me was read in full, only to have one of the council members explain that actually their main objection had been to the fact that groups of women had been examined at one time rather than singly. Whether Saud made any attempt to accommodate this additional prescription for solving his problems is not clear. But if he did, it seems unlikely that it made any measurable difference. It's evident at this point that the endless debates, and, and I'm skimming over them, uh, about privacy uh, were actually an indirect way of communicating to Saudin that the leprosy survey was simply not a priority. From the Swazi perspective, Saudin was pouring an immense amount of energy into addressing an illness that had never affected very many people and that had never been a source of special concern within Swazi society. What Saudin and Kalanen critiqued as apathy on the part of Swazi leadership regarding the well-being of their people was more likely the result of a simple calculation of the benefits of the survey as compared to the effort involved in making it succeed. This sort of failure of alignment was certainly not a problem uniquely confined to Swaziland. Uh, Melissa Grayboy's work on medical research in East Africa demonstrates that the, this sort of failure often frustrated medical researchers who found that living, breathing Africans consistently refused to accept objectification in the way that photographs and cadavers had during their training. Despite these problems, the leprosy survey was not a complete failure. For one thing, it had not become, as Walter Johnson had feared back in 38, uh, the cause of unnecessary alarm among Swazis. They were apparently not nearly as ready as Johnson expected to take on Western stigmatization of the disease. Secondly, the survey did uncover some additional cases of leprosy, many of whom uh, eventually underwent <coughs> successful treatment. Finally, the survey work convinced Saudin that leprosy's distribution in the country was essentially nodal, with the greatest concentrations in the north and in the west, an observation that held up reasonably well during the following decades of leprosy work. These modest victories, however, were utterly inadequate to counteract Saudin's conviction that the survey had been a failure. During the three years of the leprosy survey, Saudin had accumulated a long list of explanations for its failures 
to achieve his vision of success. Each of them placed the blame squarely on other people, including some mild and usually indirect criticisms of his fellow British officers, whose policies and personal initiative he regarded as lacking. Uh, but primarily, and much more directly, Sowden placed blame on the Swazi people, for whom he developed a remarkable disdain. He felt, for example, that the uh, Swazi fear of witchcraft uh, prevented people from giving any information freely. His 1949 report uh, encapsulates many of these frustrations, and you can read his words there behind me. The people of this area are typically Bushveld indigents, indolent and inert. The male population seems to have no apparent respect for their chiefs or the administration. A comparison between the number of taxpayers on the register and attendances at the tax camp will justify this criticism. Despite this, I have no doubt that the attendances would have been improved upon had the chiefs and indunas passed on to their people the information given them concerning the survey. I personally spoke to two indunas, that's a local headman, and arranged to visit their area four days later. When I arrived there, I found that despite their insistence that they had called their people, crawls within shouting distance were ignorant of the purpose of my visit. Dates and times seem to have no significance for the inhabitants of the Bush Belt, and the crawl to crawl search for Uchwala seems to be a full-time occupation for the majority. <laughs> Regarding these complaints, he enjoyed considerable support from Callanan, the director of medical services, who thought Swazis compared poorly to other African peoples, whom he judged as having a more enlightened attitude towards measures designed for the general welfare of the community. In light of these failures, Soudan and Callanan favored a shift in strategy, relying upon the positive testimonies of patients discharged from the new Mbalusi <coughs> Leprosy Hospital to motivate other potential cases to come in voluntarily. Ironically, this strategy, in essence, affirmed the position that Sir Walter Johnson had suggested 10 years earlier when he argued that a full-scale leprosy survey was unlikely to produce satisfactory results. The fact that Johnson's now proven to be relatively sage counsel came out of the colonizing experience is a good reminder to us that good ideas did sometimes emerge in colonial contexts. The fact that his counsel went largely unheeded is, unfortunately, also a reminder that the colonial administration was, far too often, a place where good ideas went to die. Thank you very much. Questions or comments? They're just overwhelmed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it might help some of the people. I know this is perhaps prominent for me to ask you to say this, but what brought you into this study? What prompted you? What's your background with this, this work? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot of you who already know this, so I, I can keep this really short. But yeah, I mean, my parents uh, were medical missionaries, and Swaziland was home uh, for a while, and uh, the Imbalusi Leprosy Hospital, which I referenced only briefly, uh, was the place where uh, my family went to church for a couple of years early in our time in Swaziland. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, my, my personal connections to this story, not, not to this particular story, but to the larger context, are uh, deep. Was this what you presented in Belgium? No, it's not. That was something else entirely. This is the first time I've ever done this, so you guys can let me know if I succeeded or not. Any other? Stacey. I would just comment that as a researcher who that involves human subjects on a regular basis, is just reminding you of the importance of a couple of things. First of all, understanding what you're asking oftentimes of participants when you do research can be terribly burdensome. Mm -hmm. And then also the importance of being culturally competent when you're doing research and then you are analyzing those results and those kind of things. So yeah. Remind me of those two things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's obvious, you know, that, that Saudi's chief failure is that he just he doesn't want to pay any attention to, to the local context or to local opinion. All he really cares about is sort of his vision of how this needs to happen that he learned in some other context, right? 
And it was even another African context, and so he's like, well, it worked there, so it's surely going to work here, right? Because all of Africa is exactly the same, uh, except that it's not. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, the young man from the Church of Nazarene and met missionaries in Swaziland and meeting in Elizabeth Cole and Samuel Hines and other missionary books. Uh, this, this seems a very familiar story on some level that I, I greatly appreciate. Do you know whether any of those Nazarene folks had any connection with Saudi and the others? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, um, I've, I've cut out all kinds of references to Nazarene missions uh, in, this, in this particular paper. I mentioned, uh, I mentioned briefly that there was a nurse who was accompanying Saudi, to, and she was, uh, her name was Nora Earnshaw. She was not a missionary, but she was trained uh, at the Nazarene Hospital, was a Naz uh, Nazarene from Swaziland, and she, uh, she's part of this. And Soudan uh, works with the Nazarenes at the Imbalusi Leprosy Hospital for a couple of years uh, in another sort of facet of his work that I just don't have time to explain today. But. Thank you, Bill.